How many of you are familiar with this, this uh, common interaction when I, if someone walks up to you and goes, how are you? And you know what we typically say, don't you? What do we normally say? Normally we lie through our tooth. Because sometimes you say, I'm good, and inside you're dying in a pile. And sometimes you say you're good because you're really good, and that's, that's good. I was doing some research this week, because that's what preachers do is research, and I came across some responses to how are you doing. And they kind of identify whether you're in a thriving mode or a surviving mode. Do you know where you are today? Are you thriving or are you surviving? And maybe some of these will help you. I'll give them to you and you can use them later. By the way, there was a whole bunch of responses, but they are, all aren't, weren't good to share in church. So I edited, all right? Uh, if someone says to you how, you, how are you doing? You could say today, I'm better now that I've seen you. Isn't that a good response? I'm better now that I've seen you. Uh, you may say, I'm just taking in air. That's all I got, just taking in air. How about, uh, I am happy to be alive. That sounds like a thriving statement, doesn't it? If someone comes up to you and goes, how are you doing? You go, I'm happy to be alive. Then you're doing pretty good. Um, sometimes you reply, you know, it, it, it could be better. What's the other part of that? It could be, it could be worse. Mm -hmm. We had a man at our church in Ohio, and every time I'd ask him, Ernie, how are you doing? He would reply, I'm blessed more than I deserve. I like that one. Blessed more than I deserve. I thought this one was appropriate. How you doing? Well, I'm somewhere between blah and... <laughs> you get that one? I'm feeling loved by God today. And there's some of you in the room, if I ask you today how you're doing, your response would be, just give me a hug and let's leave it at that. Did you come to the house of God today desiring to be obedient to the Word of God? To live victorious in your Christian life and your walk with Him? And to live daily with a confidence of the testimony of God at work in your life? Does that sound good to anybody else? You know, I honestly believe that if I can live my life every day with an obedient action, a victorious faith, and a confident testimony, I wouldn't be in survival mode. I would be in thriving mode. I would be moving in a way that I can see God at work at my life. There's actually a medical term called failure to thrive. Now, again, I had to do research because I don't know that stuff on my own. But my wife was helping me understand this, that failure to thrive is a diagnosis of, of an accelerated or an arrested physical growth. And they'll look at uh, if there's an abnormal growth or a lack <laughs> of development, then sometimes this label of failure to thrive is what is applied. And oftentimes it's a re in relation to malnutrition. Failure to thrive, just... Just not getting all the nutrients and all the nutrition that you need in your life for this baby, this child to survive or really thrive. And I would say to you this morning, there's a few of us in this room that may be diagnosed as failure to thrive today. And you don't need me or anyone else to define it for you because you know in your spirit that there's not vibrancy like you once had or like you have longed for. There's not strength that enters into your bones with such confidence that you know whose you are and who you are. And that's what I want to talk to us about today. Are you familiar with this passage of Scripture, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. You familiar with that passage of Scripture? We quote it quite often. But part of what we fail in this passage is to look back up a little bit in Proverbs chapter 3. Because in verse 1, it tells us, My son, do not forget my teachings. 
but let your heart keep my commandments. Now watch this. If you're really going to trust in the Lord with all your heart, if you're going to lean not on your own understanding, and if you're going to acknowledge him in all your ways, and if he's going to guide your path, guess what you have to have? You have to have an intake of the word of God in your life. And in verse 1 of that chapter, it says, don't forget my teachings. Get into this book and learn what I have to say to you. And then obey it. Don't just hear it. Don't just retain it, but learn how to practice it. And I think Peter follows up with that in chapter 3, verse 18 of his second letter. Because he says, now grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. How are you doing at that? Are you growing? Are you maturing? Are you more like Christ today than you were in previous days? Can you mark it? Can you track it? How many of you had a growth chart in your home with your kids? You know, you line them up against the doorpost and you, you marked it. That was one of the things I hated to leave the most when we moved from our house in Ohio to Virginia is I didn't get to bring my doorpost with me because I had my kids' growth chart on that doorpost in the kitchen. And I could watch them mature and grow. And today I, I see my kids who are maturing in their walk with the Lord, who are serving their Lord, who are worshiping their Lord. And I get it. They are growing in grace and knowledge. And I want that for my kids. I want that for me. And I want that for you today. I want you to be able to walk out of this place today with the Spirit of God having settled so deeply upon you that there's a longing and desire and a thirst and a hunger for righteousness. That you go, I'm done with survival mode. I'm full on into thriving and learning and growing and becoming and doing all that Christ would want me to be. But do you see the second part of that 2 Timothy, 2 Peter 3.18? We do all of this. We grow in grace and knowledge, not for our benefit. It is for our good. But it's not for us. It's, we're not the end game here. The end game is to Him be the glory for now and in the day of eternity. That means the glory of God gets to show up in your life right now in the way you live and move and have your being, in the way the Spirit of God interacts with you, in the way you interact with the Word of God. The glory of God goes on grand display for all the world to see. And it will be displayed here, and it will be displayed for eternity. Why do we need to think we wait for God's glory to show up when this world transitions into eternity? He has put it on display in you and I today. And I hope you and I are displaying it well. If you've got your Bibles and you're over in 1 John, and pastor's been walking us through this series and just give you a shout out today, as, as you've figured it out by now, the skinnier pastor is not here today, all right? I, I like it, because, yeah, I like it that way, the skinnier pastor. Hey, just give him a shout sometime. He finished his first half marathon yesterday, and he did really, really well. He can't walk today, but he ran really well yesterday, and we're really excited for a pastor and what God is doing. He gets a couple days off this week. And we're wrapping up this series on nothing but the truth. And we've been camping out in 1 John, and he's just done a wonderful job walking us through this text. And today we're going to live in 1 John chapter 5. And before we dive into your worship guide and the notes you have there, I want to highlight just the first verse and two key words in it. It's the words belief and born. So here's the verse, and you got your Bibles with you. It says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever is born of Him or is born of God. And if you circle that word belief, it's not just an intellectual belief. It's not just a cursory knowledge about Him. This is a full-on trust in the object of your belief. This is a, a full-on 
dependence on the one that you say has loved you and redeemed you and saved you and purposed you and called you and prepared a place for you one day in heaven. It is the one to which you are in absolute reliance upon. And I'm always amazed how many of us in the room are absolutely confident that if we died today, we're going to heaven one day. Anybody in the room? If you, if you died today, heaven's your home. Talk to me. Absolutely. Because we can rest in the promises that he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then one day I'm going to come back and I'm going to receive you to myself so that where I am, you can spend eternity with me. That's what he says. And we rest in that promise, don't we? But you know what we struggle with? Today. Because for some reason, eternity seems like it's going to be a whole lot easier than today is. But God says, my grace is sufficient for you right now. Right now. And I, his encouragement is, would you believe today that the God of eternity is the God of the present and is the God of the moment? Who upholds you with his mighty righteous right hand? That's who we have. John writes this magnificent letter to help us learn what it means to really believe. And he, I'll just give you a couple of verses that he gives us throughout the text. He says, I write to you so that your joy may be complete. I write to you so that you will not sin. I write to you because your, for, your sins are forgiven for His name's sake. I write to you because you don't know the truth and I want you to. I write to you because people are trying to deceive you with false teachings and a false narrative of the gospel. And he says, I want you to know the one true and living God who is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, I write to you so that you can know that you have eternal life. Would you today just rest in the belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Most High Living God and He rules and reigns today? Doesn't that sound good? He says, those that believe that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Born of God. We take on His image. Genesis 1.27, we were created in the image of God. Romans 8, 29, that we might be conformed to the image of the Christ. That we'd actually start to look like Him and talk like Him. I was in a meeting not long ago, and those that were sitting with me in the meeting who know my dad leaned over to me and said, leave your inner Clifford inside because I look like my dad and I talk like my dad. It's that we were sitting at the table last night and we were telling stories and I could hear my dad speaking. Has anybody ever, do you ever do that with your parents? You can hear them in the way you talk and your mannerisms and what you do. You know why? Because I am a son of Cliff Hartley. And the DNA of Cliff Hartley courses my veins. I have spent time with him. He is invested in me. I have watched him walk. I have worked with him. I have spent hours under his teaching. And the very impact of his life has been tattooed upon mine in some ways. Oh, to God, that you and I would spend so much time in the Word of God and in the presence of God that we'd begin to look like him and walk like him and talk like him and that the DNA of the Father would show up in grand display of what it looks like in our life. Many of us, we're walking through as if we still have a defeated, dead Savior, but we do not. He's risen. He's alive. He's preparing a place. He's coming back. And those of us that confess this as our, as our anthem, that we're surrendered to Him, says we are born of God. you got to hear this. John keeps writing in this book. He says, so you have confidence the evidence the proof that you've really been born of God, he says you will keep his commandments. Now let that one lay heavy on you. By the way, if you came to church today looking for light and fluffy, that's not today. 
Light and fluffy is another day, all right? We're going to let the text speak. We're going to let the Word of God speak. And he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, that if you are really born of God, you will keep His commandments. He goes on to say that you will learn to walk like Christ walked. He says that you will stop loving the world and all the things the world has to offer. He says you will stop hating other people and you'll actually start loving them. He says in chapter 2 that you'll start practicing righteousness. You know what that means, don't you? Actually do what you say you believe. Put it into practice. He says in chapter 3, if we really are born of God, we'll stop sinning. He says we'll know that we are possessed by the Spirit of God. In the verse we're looking at now, he says if you're really born of God, you will believe in the Son of God. In verse 4, he says you will become the overcomer of the world. And in verse 11, he says that you become the living testimony that one day you will live eternally with God. That's where we're living in this text today. That you and I would move from a survival kind of faith, from an I hope so kind of living, into a vibrancy and to a thriving, active faith that puts on grand display for all the world to see, your friends, your family, your co-workers, and those within your community, that you would put on display for them that Christ in me is glorified. How are you going to do that? Well, John gives us a couple things. First thing is there's an obedient love that's going to be in your life. You're going to start to a practice obedience And you're going to practice obedience because of the one that you love. In verses 2 and 3, we're back in 1 John chapter 5. He says, now by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. Now how are you going to know that you're really being obedient to what God's asked you to do? How will you walk out of your room, out of this room this week? What will be the metric that you'll use this week to determine, am I being a fully devoted, passionate followers of Christ? Am I living according to scriptures? He says, one, you'll love God. How many of you good with with that, you think? got, Got that one? Check mark, love God. Well, that's good. But you know how you'll know that you love God? is when you love everyone else who is also a child of God. And now you're going, now you're just messing with me. Because I know some people that are a little bit difficult to love. Right? I'm not looking at any this morning. I promise I'm not. I'm looking at But I know some people that are challenging in my personal walk And yet Scripture says, Todd, if you really love me, you will love those that are also born of me. If you're my child, then you will love those that are also my child. I have one brother, older, two years older than me. His name's Brett. And for the most part, most of my life, I have thought, if I could be anyone on earth that I really wanted to be, it would be Bret Hartley. He was a cut above. Except for one day. We were kids. Mom had asked us to go out and clean out the garage. We didn't want to clean out the garage, but we went out to clean out the garage. Now, he says I provoked him. I'm certain I did not. But what I do remember is we're cleaning out the garage. I must have said something to him because he picked up a coal shovel. Do you know what a coal shovel is? The flat side of the shovel. And as I looked up, he roundhoused me square in the face with a coal shovel. Say, aw. Absolutely. And I remember thinking in my mind and in my heart, mom's going to kill him. And I get to watch. 
But my mom was an equal opportunity disciplinarian. We both got a whipping that day. I got smacked in the face with a coal shovel, and I get spanked at the end of the day. Now, why do I tell you that story? I really don't know, other than it's a, it's a fun story, but it illustrates a point. There are times in our life where circumstances and situations, we want to justify our behavior. And we want to say, you know, I know I'm supposed to love that person. I just don't want to like them anymore. I'm supposed to love God, so i got to love them. But I really don't have to demonstrate love to them. Here's how this text works. If you really want to see and if you really want to evaluate what your love for God looks like, evaluate it what your love for others look like. Because your love for God will never look any different than what your love for other people look like. That's the truth of the text. That's what he tells us, that we need this obedient kind of love. And when he says obey our commands, this is in the present tense. It's to obey and to keep on obeying them. It's to allow the Word of God to be that which we walk with through our life. That day by day, we experience the Jesus of the text, the truth of the Scripture, the power of the Almighty alive and at work in our life. The Bible says the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. That it is this alive and vibrant text. That it breathes life into us. And the truth of the matter is most of us haven't picked up the text since you were here last Sunday. Oh, but I love Jesus. But you're not obeying His commands. You're not hungering and thirsting after the Word. You're not allowing your life to be transformed by the truths of Scripture. Most of us, some of us, don't take time to study it and to know it and to digest it. We just simply come to church and allow the professionals to teach us what it says. But he says, I want you to have a belief that those that are born of God will love God, and that love will be demonstrated by the way they love other people. And I love what he says at the end of the text, in verse 3. He says, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. The Word of God was never meant for you and I to be this that was placed over top of us. That was a burden upon us. It was that to be which was placed underneath us. That became a light unto our path. A lamp unto our feet. That which would guide us to where we would go. It's not that the Word of God would become a burden to us, but it would be nourishment to us. I'm reminded of of Paul who said that he asked that he would be delivered of this body of death. And I I need to give you this word picture. It's one of my favorite word pictures in Scripture. When Paul writes that he would be delivered of a body of death, the time of the writing and in the culture of the day, if you had murdered, if I had murdered an individual, now brace yourself, they would take the body of the person that I had murdered and strap it to my back. And I would wear that dead, decaying, stinking, rotten body on my back, everywhere I went, to the shower and to the bed and to the marketplace and to the dinner table. It would never be off of me. And as that body would begin to decay and rot and disease would overtake it, that disease would then transfer itself onto me. And that would be the penalty of my death. Would I have to wear this dead, decaying body? Doesn't this sound awful? And Paul writes, oh, that you would deliver me of this old man, that you would deliver me of this body of death and cast off that which is dead and decaying and rotten and destructive and set me free. Does that not give you a different picture of what it means to be unburdened? Scripture says when the Son, when, when the Son of Man sets you free, you are free indeed. Why are you and I walking around today as if we still have the old, dead, decaying body strapped to us? 
Why are we looking at the commands of Scripture and the beauty of the Word of God and the obedience to what He's asked us to do and we act like it's the weight of the world upon us and He says, would you cast that off and would you walk in the newness of life and would you know what it is to enjoy my presence today? Because He's the one that said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you and where you go, I'm going. He's the one that said, I cannot deny myself. And I have made an oath to you. I read this morning to our, our, some of our servant teams out of Psalm 121. I look into the hills from where does my help come from? You know what the text says. My help comes from the Lord. Psalm 137, I believe, says, Why are you so downcast, O my soul? I will put my hope in God. And you need to hear this morning what Jesus says out of Matthew chapter 11. Would you just allow him to whisper it to your spirit today? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm humble in heart. And I, you will find rest for your souls. Because my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And today the father says to his kids, Will you love me? Show it. Do you trust me? Obey me. It's not a burden. It's a delight to walk with Jesus. I like the next part of the text. Verse 4 talks about a victorious faith. It says, for everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. Would you just let that, I, I love this word, would you just let that percolate for a moment? Everyone who loves God has overcome the world. Now, who loves God? Those that are born of God. Who's born of God? Those that have put their belief in Jesus as the Christ. That's what the text has just told us. If that's you this morning, then you have overcome the world. You do not live under burden anymore. You do not live under despair anymore. Jesus is greater. He's greater. And he says that... And this is the victory that has overcome the world. It is our faith. We get to practice an obedient love and we get to live in a victorious faith. And in this world, we understand it, don't we? There's battle going on. Spiritual world, carnal world, God's influence, Satan's influence. People who are ruled by faith, people who are ruled by the flesh. Pastor talked to us just a couple weeks ago out of chapter 2, where Satan will come, to, come at us with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the, eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. That's the only three bullets he's got. That's the only thing Satan can come at you with. I'm always amazed at that. Because he seems to eat my lunch every day. And all he has is lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. You would think... After 52 years, I would be able to spot that. But he's continually pressing in on us. And if I get stuck in 1 John chapter 2, 5, 15 through 17, that Satan is always going to be tempting me in these three areas, I get very discouraged. But I have to read John chapter 16, verse 33, which says, In this world... You will have trouble and trials. I read that part of the verse and I get an amen out of the house, right? Anybody, anybody say that speaking truth? In this world, you will have troubles and trials. Problem is, Satan gets us to stop right there on that verse. You got to finish the verse. He says, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Yes, troubles and trials. Yes, struggles. 
but greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And we get the opportunity and we get the privilege and we have the right and the obligation to walk through this life with a love for God that is so obedient to what he's asked us to do because we live in a victorious faith in the one who gives it to us. He's the one who suffered. He's the one who died. He's the one who was buried in the grave. He's the one who rose again on the third day. And he's the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father today. And he's the one who one day will split the eastern sky and come back and say, come on, kids, let's go home. That's victory, isn't it? Does that not sound good to anybody? Lift up your head. Your help comes from the Lord. And you do not lead, need to live defeated and distracted and discouraged lives. I put this statement on the screen. I want you to be able to hear it and see it, maybe to digest it a little bit. That those who believe, and they are the children of God, they have overcome the world because their life, their love, and their identity is not determined by the deceptions of the world, but by the object of their faith, who is Jesus, the Son of God, who was crucified and rose again. Why do we let Satan convince us that living anything less than by an obedient love and a victorious faith, why do we let him convince us that that's normal? The Bible says we become at ease in Zion. But this book says otherwise, doesn't it? This book says completely different than all you are here to do is survive. Jesus said Christ is alive in us. Old has passed away. All things have become new. It says in Christ he becomes the hope on our glory. And it enables for you and I to have this grand confident testimony in who God is and what he does. I give you a longer passage of Scripture. I want you to see verses 6 through 10. And I give you a brief commentary on it. It says, This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. And not by water only, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and they agree. Now the key part of this passage is verse 9. If you receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that He, Jesus Christ, was born concerning His Son. Whoever believes in the Son has the testimony in Himself. It's a thorny passage of Scripture for some theologians, and they wrestle with what is the water and what is the blood and what does this mean and the Spirit and the three that, that testify. And I'll give you the really quick Reader's Digest of this thing. There was some false teaching going on at this time where teachers were coming in and they were telling people that Jesus wasn't really the Son of God and that the deity of God didn't come upon Him until He was baptized in Matthew chapter 3. And then that the deity of Christ departed from him when he hung on a cross and he declared, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But see, that's so contrary to the, tr the truth of Scripture. Because Jesus was always 100% God and 100% man. He did not lay down his deity. He took on his humanity to provide for you and I, re you and I redemption and eternal life and the hope of glory. So what it says when he, was, he, by the water, the blood, and the Spirit, the water, when Jesus was baptized in Matthew chapter 3, remember the skies parted and God himself spoke and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And by the blood, 
we understand that his blood was shed for you and I on a cross because it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no payment, there is no remission for our sins. And then by the Spirit, because it's according to John chapter 6, verse 44, it's the Father who draws us by the power of his Spirit. And if you and I are saved today, it's because the Spirit of God has opened up our eyes, has allowed us to yield to the surrender, to the glory and the power of his name. And he says, you know, men can testify of many things, but the testimony of God is greater This testimony of a risen Lord, of a resurrected Savior, of one who has paid the price, who has provided the redemption and the promise of eternity. That's what the text says. Oh, that you and I would walk in an obedient love, live with a victorious faith, And display a confident testimony in the hope of glory, the Son of God, who one day is coming back and will rule reign on this earth. As preachers and teachers, we always try to evaluate who's going to be in the room. And there's some in the room today that have accepted Christ as your Savior. If I ask you today that if you know today you're going to heaven, your hand's going up. There's some in the room that can recall a time where you've made that kind of a prayer, when you walked that kind of an aisle, when you had that kind of conversation. But you're not living according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, where your joy is complete. Because you're not practicing obedience. You're not loving God in a way where you're obeying His His commands. You're trapped in a failure to thrive mode because of lack of nutrition of the Word of God. And now Satan has caused you to question your faith. He's caused you to question even your beliefs. And yet you come hoping that maybe... Just maybe, you'll get back on track. Some of you have come into this room today, and the idea of being able to love fully and completely and obediently is something you've never experienced. To live with a victorious, confident life, you don't know what that's about, but you would like to. There's a great passage of Scripture that's also familiar out of Ephesians chapter 2 that I want to set up as we make a transition. It says, For by grace you have been saved through that victorious faith. Now this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. You don't get to earn it. It's what He freely provides. It's not a result of your works. And you can't boast in it, He says. Oh, here, verse 9. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. Learned a long time ago, if I can talk you into something, someone else will talk you out of it. If it's only with persuasive words, it'll be thimble deep and last just a little while. But I want you to experience John chapter 6, verse 44, and hear the Father calling you home. Not some preacher. Not some worship environment. But the loving Father in heaven that says, oh, please come to me. Find your rest with me. 
Well, please take my yoke upon you. It's not a burden. And cast all your care upon Him. So let's start where we ended. If you're here today, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to go old school. Want to go old school for a minute? Let's bow your head and close your eyes.